Perfect streaming. We're live. We're live? We're live. All right, guys. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. I am Nate Zielinski. You are watching the Tightline Outdoors live show brought to you by Bass Pro Shops. Guys, uh, huge thanks also to everybody that's going live on this page. Uh, as the cameras spool up, as the feeds go, uh, there's a good chance you're watching this from the Bass Pro National page, possibly the Bass Pro Denver page right here in regional Colorado, uh, Mr. Heater, as well as the Tightline Outdoor page. And we have some new fans out there. So guys, if you are big fans of Britt Chapman, and you're part of his Facebook page, all of a sudden you're noticing, hey, I'm not Brent Chapman, but guys, Brent Chapman is going to be joining us very shortly, and he allowed us to uh, go live from his page. So huge thanks to Brent, and uh, he'll be joining us here in about 12, 15 minutes, so make sure you stay tuned. Uh, guys, this is going to be an amazing show. Uh, again, I am Nate Zielinski. We are coming live to you. The whole concept behind this show is education. Our goal is to make everybody a better angler through education. So hopefully uh, through that educational process, whether it's better at, at you know building techniques or building a pattern, education on setting the hook, whatever it may be. Uh, again, our, our goal is to preach that education where hopefully everybody is catching more and bigger fish. Uh, guys, this show is also all about you, the viewers. Uh, so if you have questions, make sure you comment them in the comments below. We're going to do everything we can to answer your questions. Uh, and again, make sure you have some questions coming up for Brent. Because again, how often do you get to have questions for a four-time you know, winning Bass Elite Tournament angler as well as a TV host, Angler of the Year? I mean, the list goes on for Brent. So uh, again, he's going to be live here and you can ask him questions personally on this feed and we'll answer them uh, right here just for you. So again, uh, right now it seems to be that topic. We're broadcasting to in, the, across the entire nation. So we have people that are full-blown open water. We have anglers that are full-blown ice and people in between. So we're going to have topics for a little bit of everything uh, and hopefully they uh, apply to you and hopefully again they build that education for you. But again, huge thanks to everybody for allowing us to go live and huge thanks to Bass Pro Shop for being the presenting partner of this. Um, again, guys, everybody that's watching from the Brit Chapman page will be going live uh, with him here in just a couple minutes. So just stay tuned for that. Now, we always try to follow somewhat of a topic. When Brent comes on, we're going to be talking really the transformation of a fall pattern going into a winter pattern, whether you're on the ice or open water. Uh, there's probably nobody, especially living in, in Kansas, that really understands those winter patterns better than him. He lives on a lake. Um, and I think so many, especially in the bass world, bass anglers that you know are, are far southern might not get extreme cold conditions to where a lot of their bass act in a winter pattern. It's where Brent really has a handle on that. So we're really going to be talking to him, fall patterns moving into winter, whether that's winter ice or winter open water. So uh, I think it's going to be great to talk about forage uh, and just talk about being a more successful angler. So really stay tuned for that and bring those questions. Um, the main topic I want to talk about, being in Colorado, we've had a solid week on the ice here in Colorado, and I think one of the biggest things that I've had questions of is along the lines of being a more successful angler. How do I personally catch more fish? And I think there there's a million things with this. I mean, sometimes it's gear, sometimes it's you know, set up. And again, the list can go on of your individual struggles. But after doing some seminars this week, and I'd say the one thing that I found the most of is number one, spot location and catering to the fish. You know, with this being said, I'm going to throw a little example out there. Um, you know, it's been talked about over the years. So let's say I'm on my boat or I'm on shore and I pull up to a flat or an edge or a point, whatever. I pull up to a piece of structure in which I want to fish for any species. When I'm on my boat, I cast out, right? So I'll make a 100-foot cast, and I'll work a crankbait back, or I'll work a jig bat, whatever I'm working. But when I take that cast, if I work it all the way back and I don't catch a fish, more than likely, I move over five, six feet, and I cast again, and I work it back. And I do the same thing. Now, if I catch fish, I stay there, and I kind of beat up that spot. But I'm very outgoing to, to cover water, to break down the structure, and once I find fish, I might adjust my boat or adjust my catch, and I stay right on top of those fish, and I catch those fish. Now, all of a sudden, you transfer into an ice angler, right? Essentially, your entire world lives in a six, eight, or 10 inch hole. Literally all winter, your entire world goes from fishing open water six, eight months and, and making these casts and covering acres of water to down to a, a tiny hole. And somehow we lose that eagerness to cover water. So many ice anglers, and a lot of you might be this guy. You walk up, you drill that hole, and you drop that jig down that eight inch world. And all of a sudden, your entire world, your entire day, is spit down that eight inch hole. 
if you are off by an inch or a mile, so much of your success rate is going to fall into that pattern. And so many times you're not going to catch fish because you're making the fish and asking the fish to work too hard. So my goal when I talk to people about spot location is to cater to the fish. Think of it this way. Delivery services such as pizza or Chinese or whatever food you're going to order. Delivery services have excelled because it's great to, to have something cater to you. It's great to have that delivery service. Right now, you know, 6.30 at night if you're in the Rockies region, wherever you're listening from, you're tired, you had a long day, it's early in the work week. How great is it that we can sit in our house, on our couch, and order food and have it come straight to us? If the option is there to go out, drive five miles away and pick up food versus having it delivered to your house, it's great to have it delivered, right? I mean, I'm not lying. I'm not trying to say we're lazy, but it's great. I mean, how many of you... Love the idea of food coming to you. It's awesome. Same thing in the fish world. Don't make these fish leave their home, leave their comfort to come to you when you can be the delivery service and you can come to them. The concept is if you make it easy on them, you're going to catch more fish at the end of the day. Plain and simple. There's nothing else to it. So when you're setting up on a weed line, you're setting up on a point. If you're off by 10, 15 feet, water's cold. The bait fish is stacked together. Generally speaking, regardless of species, it's easier to get a meal in winter than it is the summer just because everything is gathered up. There's bugs in the mud. So instead of them cruising around and fish having to work for them, they can cruise around flats and all the food is stacked together in the mud like a bug. All the bait fish are stacked up in groups to where literally as one school comes through, uh, a fish can get its daily meal. So it's easier for fish to get that meal. Even though they're moving slower and metabolisms are slower, it's easier to find the food because once you're on the food, it's gathered. So with that in mind, don't make the fish work for it. So if you're on this hump, don't be 10 feet off and ask the fish to come to 10 feet because that's why you're only going to catch one or two a day. Go right to these fish. Put your fish in their face. Make it easy on them to take the meal. And I promise you, you're going to see the results delivered right back to you. So the same type concept. If right now, if somebody walked by me with a, a bowl full of potato chips and they walked by real fast, I probably would let it go. Not a big deal. I'm not going to reach out there and grab it. But if you set a bowl of potato chips right here in my face, eventually I'm probably going to take one. Potato chips, popcorn, whatever, a ribeye. If you make it easy, everybody wants that easy meal and therefore you're going to catch more fish. So when it comes to location... More so than selecting the right thing, I, I understand the food source. Once you know the food source, come directly to the fish. Wherever the, the predator-prey relationship is happening, set yourself up to be right on top of that situation. Don't make the fish work for food, and I promise you, you're going to catch a lot more fish. Now, once you're on top of these fish, it's time to catch them. We've had a, a lot of people talking to us about spoons and a variety of different baits out there. And there's no doubt in this day and age, technology is at the highest. We have more options for tackle and better paint jobs and better glow. Everything's better nowadays than it's ever been in history. So the technology is there, but you still have to have the right baits for the right day and the right presentations. I actually spent some time down at Bass Pro Shops here this last week and doing some seminars. And everybody was talking about winter spoons and ice spoons. So I actually threw together a little clip here talking about spoons. Um, and more so not saying that some spoons don't work, but I'm talking about a topic here that a lot of people don't think about. And again, the entire concept here is making it easy on the fish. So instead of making a bait go like this all crazy, why don't you have a bait that stays right in their face? And where basically you, the angler, are looking at the fish going, please, take my bait. Please eat it. If you ask politely and make it easy on them, it's going to shock you what delivers and the, the overall results that you'll see. So I'm going to throw this clip right now. Uh, here I am at Bass Pro Shops. Again, it's a, it's a crazy week in there, so it's a little loud. Uh, but check out this clip. I promise you, you're going to learn something about spooning. All right. You know, there's so much tackle that you can purchase and buy and be successful with an ice fishing world. One thing we want to talk about real quick is 
concepts and techniques and baits and products that work great a lot of times outside of their normal use. So we're talking about a rattle spoon. Every manufacturer in the ice industry has a rattle spoon. It's a long slender spoon. Whether it has rattles or a straight spoon, I'm just more talking about the concept. But the average spoon that you see ice fishing is going to be a long slender spoon. And every ice angler gravitates to this. They may come in every, uh, you know, every weight, every length, and every color ever made, you know, no demand. Um, and they all catch fish. But the, one of the biggest things I think that the average angler struggles with is catering to the fish. Everything you can do as the angler to, to cater to the fish, make it easy on them. I always say ask politely. You want to ask your fish, will you please bite my bait? Anything you can do to cater to them to make it easier on the fish, the more fish you're going to catch at the end of the day. So the average long slender style spoon, whatever manufacturer, this bait comes up and it's so steep it angles down and it darts down. It does get some variance side to side, but since it's a slender spoon, it falls you know, almost at a steep angle and slides very fast returning back to bottom or back to the lower portion of your stroke on your jigging stroke. One of the biggest things that, that I do that leads to so much success for, for bass, for walleye, for pike, for trout, uh, um, is using a very wide bodied spoon. So these baits here, I mean, they're literally built to be like a, an open water trout spoon or a river spoon, almost like a daredevil. I mean, this bait is very wide, very thin. Not thin enough to where I'd consider it like a, like a flash spoon. It's not made of tin. It's actually made of steel, so it's a little heavier than a lot of them. Uh, but again, this is just a very common, you know, run of the mill spoon. But the nice thing is you get the same, you know, up and down at, or the same up action as a normal spoon, darting, flashing. But then as this bait falls, it rolls over on its back and it willow leaves down a little faster than a flash flash spoon, um, but the concept here is again it stays in the strike zone longer. So all of a sudden I have enough weight to have control, but yet I have a, a, probably a half the fall rate, um, or double the fall rate I should say, as a lot of the normal slender style spoons. So again, a bait like this I get the same flash, same vibration, but I have a much slower fall rate, keeping it in the fish's face and in the fish's strike zone longer, therefore catching more fish. Everything you can do as the angler to cater to the fish, keep the bait in their face longer, I promise you it's going to catch you more fish at the end of the day. So a bait like this, not designed in any shape, way, or form for ice, but I'll tell you what, the fish love it. All right, so again, just general concepts that I think a lot of people overlook. So the idea of a, of a flat, you know, wide-bodied spoon, something, again, that people are throwing for totally different situations. You know, your, your grandpa used it in Canada as a, as a big daredevil or whatever. It doesn't really matter the brands. It's just the, the concept of a wide-bodied spoon that nobody thinks about in winter. Nobody thinks about using that in an ice fishing situation, but a bait like that falls so much slower, it stays in the strike zone longer. I promise, again, the concept of a bait staying in their face longer is what delivers results. So again, Everybody thinks about the big picture when in reality breaking down your day or your situation your presentation to a lot of little pictures and making sure that you think about everything going on is what delivers results at the end of the day. So again, even talking about spooning in the wildest fashion, everybody's like, oh, a spoon is a spoon. Everything has its own presentation, its own action in the water. And fine tuning that is what's going to catch you more fish at the end of the day. The other thing that we're going to talk about is again, you, you obviously have this presentation here and or the, this lure, this bait that you're putting in the water. The other concept is how do you work that bait to deliver results? How do you make things look like what you think they're going to look like in the water? And there's so much that goes into this, you know, whether it's line or rod. And we're going to talk about all that type of stuff, but on top of that, everybody has a bait and you all oh, this is bait so hot, we're catching fish on it. And then you look at it and say, how do I deliver that bait? Because so many of us as an angler are like, yeah, I got this spoon and I work my rod six inches, so the spoon's working six inches. And the question is, does it really do that? So I have another clip that I filmed here at Bass Pro Shop and I grabbed a couple rods off the shelf, more to talk about action of rod. And again, this is something that I think so many anglers miss and your rod action and power is a lot of times what delivers that presentation to help you catch more fish. So we're gonna throw this clip real quick and right after that, guys, we're gonna be going live with Mr. Brent Chapman. So again, tag your friends, share your buddies, get them on a tech, get them on a call, make sure they join us here live because I'll tell you, this is gonna be a special show with Brent. All right, guys, the age-old question, how to select the correct rod for ice fishing. I'm right here in Bass Pro Shops, Denver, guys, one of our great partners. You're probably watching from their feed right now. And, uh, you know, we're in the ice fishing department. I grabbed a couple of rods. Now, the biggest thing is everybody that buys an ice fishing rod, number one, they're like, oh, I need a short rod. Is there that much to it? Ten years ago, 
literally a rod was a rod. They didn't have much action actually built into them. But now they're taking the, the strategies of a long rod, an open water rod, and transferring it into the ice world where literally you have you know, fast tips and, and everything else to where they're really built to, to be a specific rod for specific technique. Now the average angler literally is like, all right, I'm catching trout. So I'm catching two pound trout, so I need a rod that can land a two pound trout. Great, everybody's like, man, I'm going pike fishing. I need to be able to catch a pike that's you know, 10 pounds. So I need a rod that can handle a 10 pound pike or bass or walleye or, or, or the story can go on and on. But in reality, the truth of the matter, if you wanna be more successful, you wanna catch more fish, the biggest thing is to think about your technique. Now again, this can go a long ways, but the biggest goal of you as the angler when you're on the water is you wanna transfer whatever you're doing at the rod into the water. So if you know, hey, I gotta take this jig and I need to move this jig in six, eight inch crisp hops. Can you do that? Can you work that jig in six, eight inch crisp hops? And that's the problem. So many times in our head, we know what we need to do with this jig, but the rod does not allow that. So for example, let's say I'm, uh, I'm working an aggressive bait. I'm getting reactionary fishing. I got a half ounce jigging wrap right there. So again, heavy jigging wrap, dynamite bait for walleye, for bass, for, for so many different species. We love that bait, but it's a half ounce. When I work that bait, I wanna snap the rod. I want that bait to dart to the side and then flutter back and then dart to the side and flutter back. Now the problem is guys will come in here and they're like, all right, you got this Finwick rod, it's a great rod, which is a very high end rod, nice rod. Um, but guys will buy this and they're like, all right, I'm gonna go work that jigging wrap. And then all of a sudden they take this extremely light rod and they're holding it at their wrist and they literally move the jig up and they move their wrist eight inches. That's where they wanna hop this bait. But they don't think about the fact that the rod loads all the way down. So they move the rod eight inches and then the rod continues that continuation as it springs basically backwards, as it unloads. So you load the rod, then it unloads. So all of a sudden what you think is eight inches is actually down here, eight inches. So now the bait moved eight and now it's springing back up, probably another eight to 10. So all of a sudden what I'm in my head is a crisp eight inches turns into a very sloppy, slow, spongy, like 16 inches. So again, my question for you is to know, number one, your technique, two, make sure that your rod can handle that technique in which you're gonna try to catch the fish. Everybody worries about landing the fish. You gotta get the bite first. And that's really all what it comes down to. Get the bite and then worry about landing the fish. So right now on that big half ounce jigging wrap, a lot of times I'll step up into a rod that might be built for, for fishing big lake trout, fishing big pike. I mean, this rod is overkill to land a, a five pound walleye or maybe even overkill to land a, a 10 pound pike. But that stiffer action is gonna allow me to have that crisp movement, that real secure to where when I hop that rod, that rod tip moves eight inches and that's all it does. The bait falls back down. Having a rod specific for a technique gives you control. Control and control of the rod and control of the bait movement will catch you more fish. So when you're selecting a rod right now for this upcoming season or getting a Christmas gift for somebody like we are here at Bass Pro Shops, make sure that you think about a technique a technique specific rod will catch you more fish at the end of the day. Keep that in mind. All right, guys, you know, every time that we do these type videos, again, our goal in mind is to make you a better angler. And with those three little things, again, fine tuning, number one, your location. So when you go fishing, hopefully you're, you're one, having the location of catering to the fish. Instead of making the fish work for the bait, hopefully you're going to the fish and making it easy on them to catch those fish. So hopefully that's one concept that will help you catch more fish at the end of the day. Number two, what's your bait actually doing in the water? You know, whether that's a, a rod situation or a lure situation, your goal is to, to hopefully understand exactly what is being portrayed in the water. And the one thing I can say with that is, Generally speaking, across the board, everywhere you look, I think that anglers' presentations, their lure, their baits, are doing more than you think they are. So again, everybody works a bait so hard, so aggressive, because they think that's what it takes to, to get action, when in reality, it probably takes less than you think it does to get that bait. So again, those are a couple things that hopefully will help you catch more and bigger fish. Now, guys, I'm so excited about this, guys. We've been waiting weeks to do this. Without further ado, guys, we are gonna go straight to the phone and we are gonna bring on live, literally a phenomenal angler, a person that understands what's happening under the water far more than, than anybody I've ever met and or myself. So guys, we're gonna go live right now with Mr. Brent Chapman. How you doing, Brent? I'm great, hi guys. 
You know, Britt, thank you so much for going live with us, answering our questions, for going on your page. You know, uh, a great friend, Jarrett Edwards, connected us on this. Uh, and, man, it, it's absolutely an honor. I spoke with you on the radio probably 10, 12 years ago here in the Rockies region, uh, and I can't wait to, to talk to you again, guys. And, again, just huge thanks for coming on with us. Hey, my pleasure. Looking, looking forward to it. Absolutely. You know, we've been talking a, quite a bit about the conversation of going from a fall fishing standpoint into a winter standpoint. And whether that's, I mean, we have people on here right now from Argentina, from Florida. I mean, we're looking across the board. We probably got 15 states watching. So it's a wide gamut. But I think a lot of anglers, as the water gets cold, so many of us are looking for a crutch to say, man, the water's cold, the fish just aren't biting. When in reality, you know, bait's tightening up, fish are, are grouped up, and it's easy to overlook fish. So we'd love to pick your brain here real quick before we go to questions of what's going through your head, whether going into a tournament or going out for a fun day of fishing, what do you look for going from a, a fall pattern into a winter pattern? What's what's your goals when you hit the water, Brent? You know, for that's a great question. You know, when it comes to wintertime, what comes to mind for me, especially in the Midwest here, but, you know, anywhere in the country is uh, a, a crankbait. I mean, uh, you, usually for me, it's going to be a, a square bill or, or medium diving crankbait. And then maybe as a follow-up bait, maybe a jig or something like that. But uh, I, I think we all have the big misconception when it, when it gets cold that the fish quit biting. But it's really not true. I mean, I, just as an example, last year we started at uh, Cherokee Lake in Tennessee, and, and I was catching fish in way colder water than I ever would imagine. I, I remember catching fish on a square belt crankbait in 39 degree water on uh, the second day of that tournament. So, you know, here, here I had the thought that uh, that was way too cold for those fish to be biting. But, uh, you know, believe it or not, these fish will surprise you, you know, every time you go out and fish for them. I mean, absolutely. That, that's why we do it. You know, there, there's no right answer to it for sure. And again, I mean, the general concept, I had a gentleman in a seminar the other day talk to me how, how these fish, you know, shut down their eating and this and that. And, you know, long story short, if a fish doesn't eat, it usually doesn't make it. I mean, these fish, they might slow their diet down a little bit, but generally speaking, I mean, they're, they're foraging heavy 365 days a year, you know, give or take a few days and a few spawning periods. So it's just up to us as the angler to, to find those patterns, to make it win. And talking about finding patterns, we're going to throw actually right now to the producer of the show right here uh, to my side, Devin. Uh, and he's going to have some questions. Brent, we got some great questions for you lined up that people are great. asking from all over the page. Perfect. All right, Brent. <clears throat> here in the West, what is your favorite go-to uh, finesse rig with rod, line, and reel? Oh, wow. Um, well, I, I've got to say, you know, especially out West that, uh, you know, I, I was, uh, I, I'll just tell a quick story. When, when we went out to uh, the uh, Clear Lake for the very first time, or maybe it was like the second trip or two out there, I remember being out there and, and you know, Clear Lake's known as a, as a uh, swim bait, jig, big, big fish type of deal. And, and I remember at the time we had co-anglers and I had a co-angler in the back throwing a drop shot. And I'm like, I'm not going to throw a drop shot on uh, Clear Lake. You know, I'm not going to do it. But uh, I think it was about 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning where the uh, co-angler, he's, he's continually putting fish in the boat, culling fish, and I still don't even have a limit of fish. And finally, I'm like, got to the point, I'm like, all right, I got to break out the, the spinning rod, you know, a little medium, medium action spinning rod with uh, now with, with a 10-pound gamma braid and a, probably an 8-pound gamma fluorocarbon leader but with a drop shot and that drop shot, you know, I was like, I'm going to get the drop shot out, drop shot out and I'm going to catch a limit of fish. And it was unbelievable. I, I think from about 1030 that morning till weigh in time at three o'clock, I basically caught my limit of fish and cold out everything I had and weighed in like 23 or 24 pounds on a drop shot. So, uh, you know, it, it really opened my eyes to uh, a drop shot, not only being a way to catch a limit of fish, but catch some big fish and put a big bag of fish in the boat as well. I mean, absolutely. No, I got to ask you this real quick while I have it before we jump to other questions is I can tell you that personally speaking as a walleye angler and a Western person, you know, Pike and Lakers drop shots were, were non-existent to me. I mean, I literally up until a couple years ago, I never used one to me. It was a, it was a bass situation and I just <laughs> didn't do it. And I can literally tell you that, 
Last year, I had one of the best days fishing for lake trout, 25, 30 pound fish using a two ounce cannonball and mm -hmm. like a, a nine inch plastic up on a, on a drop shot fishing in a hundred feet of water. Something that to yep. me was unheard of, but it worked. And you know, now I do most of my perch fishing with drop shots. I'm doing rainbow trout fishing with drop shots. It's a technique that literally keeps a bait in the strike zone and it makes it so easy on the fish, it delivers results. And the other thing I think to talk about with finesse that I think so many people talk about is you can almost finesse fish anything. I mean, you slow things down, you cater to the fish a little more, and you can almost connect, connect it to that finesse style angling. Yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, the drop shot rig, it's just a different way to rig baits. I do a lot of saltwater fishing and uh, we're, we're rigging a lot of our saltwater baits now. We'll, we'll live bait and dead bait, but, but rigging it in a drop shot format is really a good way we're fishing out in 80 and 100 foot of water to to feel that bait as well so uh you know it's just a, a different way to rig and like you said you've had good results with it and and uh you know it can be very effective for a lot of different species for sure i mean that's it in any way just just gives you the control so perfect all right Devin, let's uh, let's hit another question here <clears throat> all right what's your go-to jig for semi-stained water in the winter on cloudy days a pretty specific question here <laughs> well that that is for sure but but i'm, I'm going to stay very generic with it because whether i fish in florida kansas texas california or new york i'll tell you there's one go-to bait for me and i basically always have one tied on it's a it's a half ounce to a five eighths ounce black and blue flipping jig with a uh you know probably a blue sapphire you know, craw type trailer on there. I mean, it, it's a bait that, that catches fish all around the country, all seasons of the year. So if I had to pick one, that would definitely be it because it's such a versatile bait. And sometimes I think we as anglers tend to get more hung up on the colors so much as the fish, but uh, there's one thing about it, black and blue works anywhere I've ever been in the country. There, There's no doubt about it. I agree with that hundred percent. Now I gotta say too, and I would love your take on this, as a guide, as a tournament angler, I can tell you, I I don't pay attention to, to the overcast thing, whether it's bright sun, overcast. I mean, I obviously changed my approach a little bit, but you talk to anglers at seminars or, or wherever, and it always comes up. And to be totally honest with you, I, I know I'm naive a little bit, and I know that, especially as a guide, I fish the same waters the same day, and I get way too comfortable. I mean... Mm -hmm. to the point to where it hinders my daily approach. But I don't pay attention to that near as much as I think other anglers do. What's your take on that? I mean, how much do you really change sunny skies, cloudy skies, things like that? I mean, is it a big, big player for you? It, it might be some subtle changes, you know, back, back to that jig, you know, I mean, I might switch, if I wasn't getting the bites where I felt like I should, I might switch to maybe a black trailer or, or more of just a solid blue, black and blue type trailer. But, uh, no, you're, you're exactly right. And the best way I can describe that is, is uh, we tend to think that these fish are tuned into a particular color bait or certain bait. And then we'll go somewhere and I'll use Florida as, as an example, because Florida is a place where in a small area, there will be a whole lot of boats fishing that same school of fish, you know, in several acres. And what's funny is you'll get dialed in. You'll think, man, I, I, it's got to be this. Uh, you know, this June bug crawl with a three eighths ounce weight and it has to be this. And, and then you, you go to weigh in and or after the tournament, you start talking to other guys and here you think you caught them on this bait and this color. And you find out the guy right over here that you watch catch fish too, he's using something completely different. So it's basically what you have confidence in. The biggest challenges is finding the fish. And then from there is presenting those fish with a bait that you have a lot of confidence in and can can fish effectively and confidently and hopefully get those fish to bite i i agree 100 percent. confidence is is literally the the best rod the best bait uh the best boat that you literally can have as an angler confidence uh catches fish more than anything else out there now Brent, i know you're busy we're gonna do one more question here real quick just because we're getting so many questions uh and then we'll let you go but i would love to love to get your input on one more question here <clears throat> all right uh in your home state of Kansas, any tips for catching white bass or wiper? Uh, <laughs> wiper. That's what, my, in like, the I, home state I, of Kansas, catching white bass or wiper. Well, I'm going to tell you my way I fish for white bass and wiper. I go bass fishing, and while I'm bass fishing, 
if I happen to stumble on some white bass or wipers, then uh, I'll keep on fishing for them. But uh, yeah, you know, white bass and wipers are, are basically a a a shad based type of fish. I mean, they're always chasing shad around. So you know, a, a, a small crankbait, a shad imitation crankbait, or uh, uh, a swim bait is probably going to be your your best uh, go tos to to catch them. And then you know, in in the uh, late spring and summer is when you can uh, also get on some some top water action as well. But uh, for, for me, usually when it comes to those, it's uh, it's stumbling onto them while I'm bass fishing. And it's usually, if I stumble into them, it's usually on a form of a, a crankbait or a swim bait. That's awesome question. Pre- appreciate that so much. And, you know, I got to say, th- this coming year is my 18th year as a guide here in, in the Western Bait States. And I've guided wipers for all those years. And I got to say, when I get the trip request that comes across the internet, hey, Nate, we want to go catch wiper. It literally is like the most stressful trip ever because you can have the best day in the world on wiper today and you go out tomorrow and you literally can't find them. I mean, you could drive around for six hours yep. staring for them and they just disappear. So, I mean, half the time it's just a struggle finding them, let alone catching them. And then once you start catching them, staying on them. So I love wiper for the fight and the challenge, yep. but on the other half, it can get frustrating because it's not a fish that holds a pattern as much as I think people think they do. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And that's probably one of the things that, that for me, like I said, I go bass fishing. If I stumble onto them, yeah. I'll catch a few and take advantage of it. But, uh, you know, you're, you're exactly right. They're very, very hard to pattern and stay consistent. You know, there are certain periods throughout the season where they'll get up schooling and you can catch them on top water and they're easy to, easy to follow because you can see them bust in the surface. But uh, the majority of the time, they're very, very elusive. White bass, on the other hand, I've I've, I've caught my fair share of white bass and enjoy it. I, I know in the spring times, the fish will tend to migrate up the, the rivers and all that to spawn and they'll congregate then. And you can usually have some pretty good action. But uh, for wipers and white bass, traditionally for us is uh, probably the most consistent is when uh, some of the reservoirs are, are discharging, you know, water and they catch them below the dams and all that. And that's probably when you can have your best action on them for sure. Definitely. Awesome, Britt. Now, real quick here, I can't tell you the knowledge that I personally, as a tournament fisherman, again, as a guy, that I've learned from you personally over the years, whether it's watching it through tournament trails, watching you on TV with various different shows, or, you know, just, just catching the education that you provide. I don't think that enough anglers take advantage of that, especially right now. Obviously, you have your giant fan base that are watching you on Facebook right now, but coming from the Bass Pro National page and some people from our page, with this audience right now, how do more people gain your knowledge? Where do we learn from you? Walk us through this coming year. Obviously, you know, you're know you a tournament angler. You're doing so many different things in the angling community. I would love for people to know where you're going to be this coming year. What tournaments are you excited for, and where can we learn more from you? Where's your where's your outlets? Well, absolutely. Uh, you know, our, our bread and butter is doing the Bassmaster Elite Series. This will be my 22nd or 23rd year doing the Bassmaster Elite Series. Congratulations on that, sir. Seriously, congratulations. Uh, th- thank you. And then uh, on top of that, we're also doing uh, Major League Fishing. So, uh, you know, you can, you can watch those, which those are usually delayed a year. So what we did this past year, you'll get to see uh, this upcoming spring. And then uh, our show now that we've, uh, we've started doing is, is called Pro vs. Joe. And uh, we're going to be start, starting to film our, our third season of uh, – of pro versus Joe. So that's a, a great deal. But then also you can reach us through, uh, through YouTube as well. And, and uh, you know, our social media channels, uh, we're always doing updates and videos there as well and helping promote our sponsors. So, uh, so yeah, just follow us. And uh, we're, you know, we're always going to be trying to teach people and, and educate uh, the, the fans for sure. That's awesome. You know, the, 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 the overall world of fishing is there's so many shows out there. I don't want to say it's flooded, but there's so many shows. But I got to say, the pros versus Joes is something that every time I've watched it, I've been like on the edge of my seat because everybody out there is like, I want to fish against that guy. And it's neat to see that. And I got to tell you, as a tournament pro, you're bringing to the table to this TV techniques that most people haven't heard of or have been redefined or brought back. And it's really there's not as many hardcore tournament anglers doing that type TV to where they're seeing this new knowledge. So, so huge. Thanks for that. Uh, Brent, I don't Absolutely. want to take any more of your time. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, thank you so much for going live from your page. And, uh, we'd love to have you back on here as, uh, as spring prevails and, uh, get some tournament updates from you as you're, as you're out there in the, in this series. Well, Hey, my pleasure. Great job. You guys are doing a good job and, uh, you know, tell all the fans, uh, 
you know, just remember, go out and have fun, enjoy fishing, and uh, for everybody out there, have a Merry Christmas. Absolutely, Brent. Thank you so much, and Merry Christmas to you and your family for sure. All right, take care. Thank you. All right, guys, thank you so much. Guys, that was literally legendary angler Brent Chapman. I mean, he's done so much in the community and has so many accomplishments between angler of the year and tournament wins and TV success. Um the guy catches fish flat out. And I got to say, I got a little spot near and dear to my heart just because he lives in Kansas. He's six hours away. Uh, so a lot of times as you as you come base from a, a Colorado angler per se, um, you know, he has that understanding for, for so much that goes out here in the Western Basin. So if you uh, haven't followed him before, if you're coming from a different outlet, make sure you give him a like and follow his, uh, his career. Uh, again, I think you'll learn so much from it. And I think as we kind of wrap up the show here in the next couple of minutes, the general concepts, again, we talk education we talk building patterns you know you heard from him talking about finesse rigs you heard from him talking about you know his go-to jigs and then we're also throughout the course of this show guys again encourage you to bring questions we talk about the the myths per se like the the cloudy weather and the sun i've probably heard over the years a thousand times ten thousand times anglers man now that the clouds cover we're going to change up you know i'll be out guiding and man the the sun just disappeared we got to change out all our baits and Again, I, I might be very naive, but I don't I don't even take notice to that as much as I think some anglers do. And, you know, talking to Brent, obviously he makes slight adjustments, but I think there's a lot of things out there that come down to yes, you're you're hardcore into this this style of angler and you make these adjustments. And some people just fish hard. Um, and throughout the course of the next several weeks, we're gonna be talking about a lot of those different myths, a lot about those different situations, uh, and hopefully give you our input. And again, there's no right answer. What Brent does, what I do, what so many of us do um, is our style of angling. It's our knowledge. But obviously, everybody catches fish and everybody does different things. I mean, you walk down the aisles at Bass Pro and you know there's a million different products. And I mean, obviously, there these companies are surviving because people are buying their products and catching fish on it. So there's no right answer. But taking the bait that you have confidence in, putting it in the right situation catering to the fish and more so paying attention to the small details if you can do everything you can to, to understand the cycle of where the fish are where the prey is that relationship building the education um overall to, to put yourself in the right situation i promise you it's going to make you more successful at the end of the day uh devin do we have anything else here before we wrap it up uh we just want to remind people to text uh tight line to 33222 uh, for notifications of when we go live. Absolutely. So if you guys like this, uh, again, we have a different pro angler guest on every week. Uh, we have education like this. We kind of jumped around tonight with a lot of different topics just because we wanted to cover all that kind of stuff. Uh, some weeks we'll talk nothing but 30 minutes of one single topic or one single crankbait. Uh, so the show really uh, it varies, but hopefully it's again educational for you. So again, text the word TIGHTLINE, T-I-G-H-T-L-I-N-E, to 33222. So just get on your phone right now, text TIGHTLINE to 33222. It's on your screen right now uh text that and we will send you a notification every time we go live uh, i know that we have a sneaky thing coming up this week we're going to be going live from the ice this friday uh we do not know exactly what time sometime mid-morning friday we will release details of that probably coming up wednesday or thursday uh but you'll only get that information if you text tight line to 33222 so make sure you do that and uh, we'll send you those notifications of when we're going live guys and this will be going live every single tuesday at 6 30 p.m mountain i hope to see you next week and a huge thanks to bass pro shops for being our presenting partner of this also a huge thanks to everybody watching on the bass pro shop page the bass pro shop denver page regionally uh mr heater huge thanks to them tightline outdoors as well as brent chapman's fans uh and again guys you want to want to see all this live on our personal page everything is coming to you from the tightline outdoors page so again go to tightline outdoors give that a like uh and again hopefully we'll make you a more educated angler and a more successful angler my name is nate zalinski we'll see you next week